This is Focus with Jack Cottle. And good evening, I'm Jack Cotta. Welcome to this month's edition of Focus. This month we're talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, how we got to where we are, where we are now, and where we are going from here. Three guests with us today, Dr. Shankar Kura. He is the Vice President of Medical, uh, Medical Affairs with Monument Health. Dr. Mark Harlow, he's the Chief Medical Officer with the Oyate Healthcare Center and the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board. And Brandy Tackett is the Director of Infusion Therapy with Monument Health. A little background of where we are since the COVID-19 pandemic began. The CDC says there are more than 48 million cases in the U.S. and more than 760. 76,000 deaths worldwide. The World Health Organization has tracked more than 260 million cases, more than 5.2 million deaths. Here in South Dakota, those figures are at 166,000 cases and more than 2,300 deaths. We're going to start with you, Dr. Kura. Uh, the first case in the U.S. found in January of last year. At what point did you realize that this was something that was going to be pretty big, and did you ever see it go on this long? Yes, Jack, uh, right when the pandemic broke. Uh, we know uh, from past pandemics that this will at least play out over a period of two to three years. And uh, how about you, Dr. Harler? When did you start to feel like this was something that was going to be something really that was going to be difficult to deal with? I was looking at a, a news release from around January. I shared with our team just a few weeks ago where it said there were 19 cases in the U.S. and one death, and it was extraordinary to consider where we were and where we are now. I would say about the same time that Dr. Kerr realized that the pandemic was an onrushing train, that we all decided that we needed to change our thinking and retool our care management for this oncoming pandemic. Did you see it at that point becoming as big of an issue and as big of a situation as, as it's been? I personally didn't uh, because of our experience with SARS and MERS previously, which had relatively low intrusion into the United States, two other pandemic type diseases uh, that uh, came from far away and they came to our country but were rather quickly uh, dealt with. And uh, so no, I have to be honest and say I did not see the range and the scope that this has become. Yeah, Brenda, you are running infusion therapy there with Monument Health. At what point did this really start to impact the operations of your department over there? Um, about uh, last November, we started hearing that there was going to be um, some new therapies coming out for the treatment of uh, COVID, uh, monoclonal antibody therapy. Um, the uh, pharmaceutical companies that pre prepare those products were petitioning the FDA for emergency use authorization. And uh, in a very short period of time between learning that these were getting reviewed by the FDA to becoming available, we had to prepare our healthcare system to administer these safely to COVID positive patients. Uh, now, since the pandemic began, South Dakota has the fourth worst case rate in the country, 14th for death rate. So how are we doing now at this point? We are better than we were in the winter peak when we saw a lot of cases. Uh, but we're not out of it. Uh, unfortunately, states around us, uh, like Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, are seeing rising cases. And that's kind of a, a forewarning that we will see a rise in cases uh, through the winter. Now, as you see rising cases around us, Wyoming has a high case rate, and you see North Dakota, and you mentioned some of those other states. How does that impact us here, and how quickly does that spread into this area and in, into this region here? Yeah, community spread is a good indicator that there is transmission occurring. And that's what we're seeing when we uh, look at our surrounding states in the Great Plains and the Great Lakes areas. That is a directly uh, informing us that this virus is being transmitted. Now, you're working with tribal and native communities, Dr. Harlow. Uh, in those groups, how is the pandemic doing right now at this point? It's uh, under reasonable control because of the measures that have been taken over the past 18 months. The Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board under the leadership of CEO Geraldine Church has had a three-pronged approach to managing COVID. First was our primary care through Oyate Health Center, and that included testing, vaccinations, monoclonals, and the setting up of an intermediate field hospital by renting the Travel Lodge Motel. When this first came upon us, we had a lot of patients who were newly COVID positive with a disease that we really didn't understand to any great degree at that time. And we didn't wish to send them back to a home full of relatives. They were too sick to go home, but not sick enough to be hospitalized. So we put them in the travel lodge, uh, made rounds on them twice a day, just as you would in a hospital, so fed them two meals a day out of Cornerstone, 
And if they got acutely ill, then we were just uh, half a mile from a monument where we could bring them over for admission to the hospital. That was the first uh, phase of our care. We also had an emergency operations center set up that provided food baskets to families, that provided transportation, that provided all manner of support as it was needed. And then the third leg was the tribal epidemiology center that managed with the state uh, contact tracing and other uh, management of the 18 tribes that are under the flag of the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board. So it really was an all hands on deck endeavor and still is. Are there unique challenges? Were there unique challenges in dealing with COVID within the Native American community here? I think because of uh, the fact that families uh, have uh, multi-generation homes where you have elders and you have parents, you have children living under the same roof in relatively confined spaces. Not always the case, but often the case, perhaps more than others. And that created the ideal situation for rapid spread. So I knew that if I sent a patient who was newly, caused, newly COVID positive back, and again, not knowing at that time what the, the natural course of this disease was, that uh, was I going to come up with now 10 new COVID positives within a few days based on sending that one person home. So the, the multi-generation home and also at Cornerstone with Men's Mission and the Women and Children's Home, also with congregate living where we have 58 men in a single large room in bunk beds. If one is sick, then within short order, many will be sick. So we had to be very sensitive to that. So we, we used the travel lodge for that and ultimately the Big Sky Motel as well, which we rented for six more months as an alternative living site. So as you learn about how COVID spreads, having a bunch of people in close proximity, is that the perfect storm for it the spread of COVID? I think it was and arguably still is. All of us now have had close contacts. None, none of us are uh, in a position where we haven't had multiple close contacts in our families, in our, in our, uh, in our life in the community. Uh, the vaccines have risen. We're now, I believe, 42% in our state, fully vaccinated, 47%, at least one shot, and hopefully climbing with the good work that Dr. Kura has done to try to diminish vaccine hesitancy. But that vaccine hesitancy remains an impediment to, uh, to getting the full coverage that we need. And uh, the, the other aspect of this is that we don't fully understand yet the benefits of natural immunity. I'm very anxious to see where we're going to come out on that. We can measure antibody levels now, but we can't measure that they're specific for the COVID-19 virus. Uh, Brandy, how are things changing? You have monoclonal antibodies is mm -hmm. one of the big things that you guys are doing now. Mm -hmm. How is that changing the approach and changing what you're able to do with COVID patients? Um, I think uh, we're, we were very excited when these therapies became available last November. It was really you know, the only tool in our tool belt to really help um, reduce the hospitalization and death rate for COVID positive patients. Um, it's changed our approach in that we um, have kind of a network across Western South Dakota of monument and non-monument um, healthcare locations that can offer these therapies. And uh, we continually work with our local providers and physicians to encourage the early use of these therapies after a patient who meets the criteria becomes positive. I suppose I probably should have asked this first. You hear the term monoclonal antibodies. What is it? And, and how does this sure. work, I guess? Sure. Well, it's a laboratory um, um, created product that is mimicking the body's natural um, antibody responses. And we're able to, in a pharmaceutical company lab, to create those and mass produce those. So it mimics the body's normal response. Um, but we're able to provide those in an IV or injectable formulation much sooner and earlier in the course of an illness before your body's own natural antibodies um, would be produced. How effective have you seen these be? Mm -hmm. So um, there's three different products that are available and they all have 80 plus percent um, reduction in hospitalization and death. So extremely effective. All right, we got to take a break. We'll continue our look at the COVID-19 pandemic here in the Black Hills in South Dakota when we continue with this month's edition of Focus. I'm Jack Cotta. Welcome back to this month's edition of Focus, talking about the COVID-19 pandemic, talking about monoclonal antibodies before we took the break with Brandy Tackett, the director of infusion therapy over at Monument Health. You said this is very effective, but who is eligible for this? Who does this help? Sure. So there's three different products that are available. Uh, they're all emergency use authorized by the FDA. 
Um, two of the products are allowed to be used for post-exposure prophylaxis. So that is for patients who are um, high risk of progression to severe illness, um, unvaccinated or vaccinated, and maybe they have an immune condition that's not going to allow them to mount a full immune response to their vaccine. Um, if they have an exposure within six feet for greater than 15 minutes, commonly household contact might be positive, and um, they um, um, uh, are then qualifying to receive that therapy. Um, for treatment of COVID positive patients, we have to have patients who are over 12 years of age, over 40 kilos, mild to moderate illness within 10 days of symptom onset, and um, high risk for progression to severe illness. And there's many conditions that can qualify you, uh, age, um, cardiac, lung issues, and uh, many other immune suppressing conditions. Uh, talking about vaccines now, Dr. Mark Harlow is the chief medical officer for the Oyate Health Center. Uh, the state said today 64% of people five and up have received at least one dose. 53% have completed their series. Nearly 15% have received a booster dose. How effective, in your opinion, have vaccines been? I think they've done a great job to perform the task they were assigned and engineered to do. The vaccines do not eradicate the virus. They were never designed to do so. They are designed to decrease the severity and decrease the duration of the illness. And in that, they have been very successful. Statistically, that's been shown time and again to be the case. Uh, I, I'm, we've used vaccines to fight illness for many decades. And this is just another tool in the tool belt, as Brandy referred earlier. Uh, I'm pleased with the way we've been able to administer them at Ayate. We've administered over 9,000 vaccines. We've done over 15,000 tests. And we've done all that we can to educate our patient population and try to keep the curve as flat as we can. But the vaccines have been very successful in performing the task they were engineered to do. Decrease severity, decrease duration. Uh, a lot of people out there still hesitant uh, to get the vaccine. How do you get that group over that hump? Conversations face-to-face, -face, explaining what the benefits are, what the risks are, uh, why we've chosen to take the vaccine ourselves, why we've encouraged our family members to get the vaccines, uh, what the risks are. Uh, in particular, and one of my children who was afflicted with Guillain-Barre uh, many years ago, uh, if we give her the vaccine, then she r runs the risk of generating an immune response and an over-response and causing Guillain-Barre to occur again, which would be very unfortunate. But if we don't vaccinate her, then she has the risk of COVID to deal with. So for all of us, there is this uh, challenge to find the right spot. For those of us that uh, have competent immune systems, I encourage everyone to get the vaccine because we should, we should do that which is within our control. And we know that this is a fatal illness. We know this has killed, as you stated earlier, over 5 million people worldwide. It's not to be trifled with. Now, as a medical professional, does it get frustrating when you see this become a political debate as opposed to a, a medical debate Very over vaccines and, the, and COVID? Very much so. And, and we were commenting before the show began, this is the first time we've seen a public health crisis of this magnitude being managed by so many people without medical backgrounds and so many people doing their own research instead of trusting the medical professionals to do so. To some degree, I would argue that that's because the messaging from, from our federal authorities has been inconsistent and at times incomprehensible. And that's why I've relied on Dr. Kura, whose messaging has been very consistent and always thoughtful and on point. All right, Dr. Shankar Kura, uh, you got a good review right there for what you have to say. When you look at vaccines, how important in your opinion is it to continue to get that percentage up? I think it's very important, Jack, given that we're seeing new variants emerge. Uh, most uh, recently, we have the Omicron, which is the newest variant. And a variant is basically when the virus is transmitted, it enters a new body and multiplies. It makes mistakes. Uh, and then when it makes a mistake in its genetic material, which is the RNA, you have a variant. Not all variants are dangerous. Um, that's why you only have four variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And delta right now is 100% of every case in the United States. What we're concerned now is this emerging variant called Omicron, which is the fifth variant of concern. 
And we've seen it uh, in Africa. Now it's in Europe and even in Canada. Uh, so it's not long before we'll see it here. The only way we can stop new variants from emerging is to vaccinate folks. And that's the way we can uh, stop this pandemic. Uh, how about vaccines for kids? It wasn't too long ago that they lowered that age to, I believe, five. The kids can get a vaccine. Why vaccinate kids when, when they're their symptoms are not as bad as a rule? Great question, and you make great points. Uh, number one, kids do well with the disease, a vast majority. A minority of kids don't do well. But the real reason um, for having the kids vaccinated is to prevent the spread. Now, five to 11 year olds and then 12 to 18, they make up the vast majority of the transmission that's occurring currently. Um, this is also borne out by uh, detailed information we're receiving from uh, the United Kingdom where they have a national health system. The surge that they're experiencing is entirely driven by school age kids. So it's important uh, to protect your families, uh, grandparents, parents uh, that are at risk um, by vaccinating children. Uh, yes, children uh, do better but when children don't do well, it's really tragic. Uh, when a child with COVID gets a dreaded complication that we call multi-system inflammatory syndrome, uh, they don't do well. So uh, we, we owe it to protect them, but also prevent uh, this spread that is continuing to occur, as you can see. Uh, when it comes to vaccines, there's a ton of misinformation yes. out there as well. What's some of the craziest stuff that you've heard that people actually believe? It's quite unfortunate. Uh, misinformation is really a problem. Um, we have a vaccine that truly prevents death, like Dr. Harlow said, prevents hospitalizations, prevents severe illnesses, and this is our only chance, and it's readily available in this country. It's free. There are no supply issues in this country, and yet we have folks hesitant because of a vast amount of misinformation. Um, unfortunately, it is being driven by non-medical professionals who don't quite understand it. And uh, there are some uh, really wild ones out there, including uh, it's a tracking device uh, by some company or the other to keep tabs on you personally, and uh, other things uh, that are, are really not true at all. Uh, we have had, like Dr. Harlow said, vaccines have been the reason why we live to be 85 today. Uh, our children are no longer uh, inflicted by uh, infectious pathogens like measles, mumps, rubella, and several others. We have 15 primary series vaccines that protect our children. And as a result, they grow up to be 85 years old, live a full life, uh, and be able to do all the things we enjoy. All right, we've got to take a quick break. We'll continue our look at COVID-19 when we continue with this month's edition of Focus. And welcome back to this month's edition of Focus. I'm Jack Cotter. We're talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. Brandy Tackett is the Director of Infusion Therapy at Monument Health, talking to you earlier about monoclonal antibodies and what a big difference that has made. Mm -hmm. Is this leading to other therapies as well as all of this research and, and development? Is that helping in other areas too? Um, I think absolutely. In the COVID um, realm, there are therapies that are being evaluated and studied um, across the world um, in death daily. Um, we are expecting that there will be some oral antivirals potentially um, coming out uh, under emergency authorization by the end of the year that may be very effective and easily administered, unlike receiving an IV um, therapy in a healthcare setting, these could be administered in your own home and orally for a short course. Um, there's also other therapies, including some long-acting antibodies, monoclonal antibodies that are being evaluated um, to help um, provide long-term protection um, against COVID. What is it? There, there seemed to be some confusion about that term. You called it emergency use, and some people mm -hmm. call that experimental. Mm -hmm. Those are two different things, I assume? It, it is. So in the course of drug approvals, there I, I think of it as a spectrum. There is on one end of the spectrum full investigational emergency or uh, investigational use. On the other end of the spectrum is full FDA approval. And in the middle is something that's called emergency use authorization. And it's something that um, is able to be um, utilized and enacted when the, the benefit really outweighs the risk and there's not many other treatments out there available to treat something that's as devastating as COVID. All right, Dr. Mark Carlo, Chief Medical Officer for the Oyate Health Center. Uh, what have we learned through all of this pandemic that we can apply down the road to a future pandemic or preventing a future pandemic? 
To follow up on Brandy's point with the emergency use authorization, it's important to know that this vaccine did not skip any steps, even though it came to market very quickly. To suggest that it's experimental on the basis of the time doesn't acknowledge the fact that through the billions of dollars made available through the warp speed legislation, these processes were sped up uh, at a rate that they've never seen before. Because to enroll 45,000 people in a study, for a drug company to do that on their own is prohibitively expensive. But with the money available through the legislative process, everything went quickly. But no steps were skipped in bringing it to market and making it safe. And so to me, that is one of the take home messages that this vaccine hesitant people need to hear. No, there was no additional risk. But it's also worth noting that on our best day, medicine is not an exact science. And what works for the majority of people doesn't work for all people. That's something we accept every day as part of the inexactitude of the science we practice. And so we take our best evaluation of the data we have and we draw our best conclusions and we make our best recommendations, knowing again that there is, there is no precision and no perfect outcome for everyone. So, but going forward, I, I think the, the take home message is use the tools that we have available to us, control that which is within your control to keep yourself and your families safe. Uh, Dr. Shankar Kura is the Vice President of Medical Affairs with Monument Health. Uh, what are the lessons that you see it that we've learned through all of this? I think the big one, uh, just like Dr. Harlow said, is we need to trust science. Uh, the vaccines have proven beyond uh, our wildest dreams to not only be effective, but effective at an astonishingly uh, vast scale. We're talking about 90 to 95 percent effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Um, that's what we're seeing right now. The outbreaks are occurring among the unvaccinated, and these vaccines are the safest agents we have ever uh, seen, and additionally, they're also protective. So I think that's the big lesson. How can we get folks to trust the science and we as uh, healthcare professionals, how can we then translate that uh, into meaningful messages people can understand? So wherever we go from here, is there a light at the end of the tunnel that you see at this point? Absolutely. I think we are uh, closer to the end than we uh, think, uh, but we need to continue to vaccinate. We need to continue to do uh, everything we can to stop transmission. Uh, we are not out yet of this pandemic. Uh, the transmission is still occurring. So um, I would say uh, we are towards the end, but we're not out of it yet. Uh, how about you, Dr. Harlow? Do you see some light at the end of the tunnel here? I do, and I concur with Dr. Curra. And the anecdotal evidence is that every weekend, millions of people gather in stadiums all across the country without masks, yelling and screaming for their favorite teams, and we haven't had a single super spreader event. So what number constitutes herd immunity? I don't think any of us know. It's gone between 60 and 90%. But I believe we have reached a point of some level of herd immunity that does make it reasonably safe for fully, uh, fully immunized people with competent immune systems to be safely out in the community. That, All right, got about 30 seconds. But you're optimistic, though. I am, sir. All right, that'll do it for us. Dr. Shankar Kura, Dr. Mark Harlow, and Brandy Tackett. I want to thank you guys for all coming up. And uh, hopefully uh, we are towards the end of this pandemic and we'll get things done. Yes. Thank you, Jack. Mm -hmm. All right, that'll do it for us for this month's edition of Focus. Hope to see you again the first Sunday night of next month. Good night.